Oh, thank you. What a joy. And thank you, Dean Moyeva, again. That was a wonderful night. And Nancy, thank you for coming today. Yeah, it's uh, good to be with you. And um, here we are on Friday before the big game tomorrow, um, which you can feel the energy on the campus, right? Um, and it has been such fun to walk around the campus because I have not been back in decades. Um, and uh, my dorm room is still intact, Deku <laughs> Hall, uh, across from Carson, where we used to go to the cafeteria. Um, but I'm looking forward to kind of seeing all the changes as, you know, after this, I want to walk around a little bit. But thank you for coming here on a Friday to talk about the labor movement, um, this moment in our country, um, what's been happening with unions and how we've been evolving and changing over time. And um, I just am excited to have a conversation. I have a few opening remarks, but I think it'll be great to, um, you know, just talk to each other. And um, this is a moment where people are kind of reevaluating unions. Um, in fact, last night I had a conversation with one person who said, don't you know that people think you're dangerous? You know, there's this perception that I'm going to show up with a baseball bat and take out somebody's kneecaps or something. Um, and that is an old stereotype that we fight as a labor movement, that we were, you know, of the past, only representing certain types of jobs. And um, now we're going to shake all of that up. And now is the time to be rebuilding a bold, modern, inclusive labor movement that represents everyone, no job off limit. And in fact, I'm looking at um, some of our student worker organizers um, sitting right here in front. Because most people know the faculties represented here, the teaching fellows are represented here. Um, and so now student workers are saying we want to have a voice as well. So um, it's a really exciting time for us in the labor movement. So we do represent 12 and a half million workers in our umbrella. A lot of people are, it's an alphabet soup, AFL-CIO. Um, an acronym from obviously 1955 where two federations merged. Um, but we represent those 12 and a half million workers in 58 different unions now. Uh, we just had a new union join. The Major League Baseball Players Association just joined. We represent a lot of sports unions, which is kind of interesting because people don't think of athletes as workers. But they are. Um, in fact, during the pandemic, the Major League, uh, or I'm sorry, the NFLPA, had some of the most groundbreaking health and safety protocols through the pandemic. And so the rest of the labor movement got to learn from their pioneering um, and what they brought to the table. So, um, you know, we learn from each other. That's, that's what's so exciting. Um, and that story about the babysitting is true. Um, I was 11, which is terrifying to think that you could be babysitting at age 11, other people's <laughs> children, right? <laughs> I was babysitting infants at the age of 11. So anyway, we did organize. Uh, Brenda Cool and I figured it out and um, got us, you know, one of us was making 75 cents and one of us was making a dollar. So we banded together. Um, and that's what unions are. And, um, and so I wanted to start by thinking about, um, you know, the working people of this country. And every day we go through our lives and we pick up that cup of coffee on our way to work or school or wherever we're headed, and often aren't even thinking about the person whose labor makes that possible. Um, you know, we're, we're making our way through our day, um, you know, ordering something online. And, you know, it's a computer and a transaction, but you think about that whole supply chain of work that goes into making the product, getting the product to your door, um, you know, all of the steps along the way. And those are working people that make that happen. And I think during the pandemic was the, one of the um, most um, encouraging times that I've seen where people were finally seeing the value of work and this notion of frontline essential workers who were the ones showing up, making the sacrifices, uh, whether they were nurses in an ER caring for loved ones during a pandemic, whether it was grocery workers who were stocking the shelves, making sure we had food that we could figure out how to get while we were wiping down all our groceries and they were showing up to work every day. Um, transit workers who were driving the buses and trains to get the essential workers to the jobs, right? Um, 
And so at one point, I think people were kind of going out with their pots and pans and celebrating um, essential workers and finally seeing them for the first time in a long time, the contributions they make. Now, since then, I think we're all starting to get back to our, our lives, right? And, and in some ways, getting back to that complacency, could I call it, or <laughs> taking it for granted. Um, but I think this notion of the fact that we think about products being sustainable, the environmental um, or carbon footprint on something, um, is it organic? And then often the notion of workers is, uh, is pushed to the side. And so I think we need to think about that um, as we go forward, as we're building the future of this country. Um, how can we make treating workers, um, considering how things are made responsibly, how are corporations treating their employees as part of that, I guess it's called ESG nowadays, right? Environment, social governance um, protocols for, for companies and how they do their, uh, how they make their goods and, and provide their services. Um, and I said last night that I chose journalism as a major because I always wanted to ask the big questions and um, you know, think about um, the big themes and, and threats and, and trends that are happening in the country and um, holding people accountable, those in power accountable. And that's why I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be Nina, Nina Totenberg on NPR. I say it all the time with pride. Um, another woman pioneer, right, in the, in the field. Um, but uh, as I kind of made my way through my career, um, having left the campus, graduating into an economy that was not working, I <laughs> was in recession at the time, and knowing that jobs, good jobs, were not available, so I worked three of them. I pieced together three part-time jobs. Um, and then I had heard that the women clerical workers who worked at the electric utility company that I worked during summers, you know, to pay for my school, like a lot of people do to make ends meet, um, those women at the electric utility company were trying to form a union. And I was thinking back to my experience there knowing that the clerical workers, mainly women, were not in a union, the power linemen and all the folks on the, that did the external work to make the energy flow through the system were in a union, mainly men, exclusively men, um, they had a union contract. They had dignity, they had respect, they had a voice, they could actually bargain for better wages and health care and to have a, some retirement security, whereas the women clerical workers were not treated with that kind of respect. And it was almost this, you have a job, be grateful for it kind of attitude. Um, and so that's why the women were actually trying to organize a union. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so I got involved in the organizing campaign. Um, the company came at us with everything it had because they saw having another union on the property as a threat. Um, and it's interesting today to think about the behavior of some companies, how Amazon, for example, is fighting a union today, here all these many years later. But companies like Microsoft, who are saying, hey, if workers want to form a union, we sh they should be able to do it. So there's two different ways a company can <laughs> approach unionization, right? Willingly or unwillingly. Um, but back then, it was unwillingly. And um, the company had these captive audience meetings. They brought us into the auditorium, told us why we shouldn't join a union. The CEO called my mom into the office have for a one-on-one -on -one meeting to talk about, you don't need a union. This is just you and me, right? We're, we're a family. But yet would turn around and essentially threaten, intimidate, and fire people for wanting to form a union. Um, so it was a big struggle. Um, I felt an honor to be a part of it, the courage that it took for people to stand up and say, you know what, we want this. Um, unfortunately, the fear creeps in and people are afraid for their jobs. And so when the union uh, election came around, unfortunately, we lost narrowly. Um, and in fact, those um, workers are still non-union today, even though the power linemen continue to enjoy a very good contract. Um, so fast forward, that was what lit the fire, right? I, I saw the difference. I saw what a union could do, especially when it came to um, you know, those who've been left on the sidelines, um, often women, people of color, um, immigrants who don't feel safe speaking out. Um, and I saw the difference that that could be when you have a union contract. Um, so that's kind of what got me started. And 
Um, you know, I think today about are unions relevant? You know, a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I'm working in a place where we get paid pretty well and I don't think, you know, we really need a union. Well, that's often because there's other unions in your community that have helped lift uh, wages and standards and then often companies take a look and say, well, we want to keep our wages up just as much as the union so that we don't have a union. Um, and then also, um, sometimes there isn't a need for a union, right? If people feel respected and heard and there's not a fear of speaking out and you are you know, being treated, treated with good wages and good benefits and healthcare, absolutely, you know, not every workplace necessarily has to have a union, right? But we think the best way to bargain to get your fair share is by sitting across a table with your employer and bringing that value add to the table because you're the ones who are ultimately making a company successful. And so to feel uh, paid and protected and heard, um, that, that union contract is a way that we can actually rationalize um, making sure that people get their fair share of that pie. Um, so it's, it's an interesting time to be uh, in the labor movement because of what's happening in the country. And as we've seen inequality rise, uh, I don't know if folks are noticing that we have this divide, right? And we've been talking about it for years where more and more of the wealth is being concentrated in a small percentage of the economy. Um, I would argue that's because of the decline of unions. And if you look back over history, there's this famous chart. I wish I had it with me that I could show it, but I'm sure you could find it online. Um, where you look at the unionization rate over time since even, you know, in the early days, it kind of peaked in the 1970s and then started declining over time. It tracks almost exactly with um, the percentage of wages uh, being held by the top 1%. So that as wealth is accumulating, union density is, is decreasing, that gulf is as a result of workers not having enough power workers not being able to sit across the table and say, you know what, we deserve more. And being, having the law on your side to be able to negotiate more. Um, and so that's the other thing I would say to people who think unions aren't relevant today. They're more relevant than ever because you can't really have that kind of power to negotiate uh, unless you have the law on your side. And when you organize a union under the National Labor Relations Act, um, that's what unions do is they give you that that uh, that leverage frankly um, and if you look over time at what unions have been able to bargain for um, they're the things that people take for granted now um, you know health and safety that didn't just happen it was because unions and workers came together collectively and fought to pass the OSHA laws that we have today and which during a pandemic, you think about how important those health and safety standards were. And actually shi we shined a light on the fact that now we take it so for granted that we're not putting resources into making sure we have enough inspectors to go out and, make, and uh, hold employers accountable to those safety standards. And so a lot of times the budgets are starting to decline um, with OSHA, for example. Um, thinking about, um, you know, sexual harassment and discrimination protections. Unions have been on the front lines of fighting back against sexual harassment and discrimination through our contracts since inception. Now, I will be honest, as a woman leader in the labor movement, I know that our past hasn't always been um, the shiniest when it came to equal treatment in the workplace and representation because uh, often women workers sometimes felt that their unions weren't standing up for them. But fast forward to today, women are the majority of union members. Out of that 12 and a half million, we have six and a half million women. So we are the largest organization of working women in the country, the labor movement is. And not a lot of people know that. Not a lot of people think of us in that way. Um, so sexual harassment and discrimination, of course, um, is, is um, something we, we never have taken for granted and fought for over time. Uh, wages, hours, and conditions, retirement security, being able to raise the minimum wage. The labor movement 
has been the one to actually bring that to the fore because the labor movement, even though our wages aren't minimum wage, we recognize that that floor needs to be lifted for everyone, right? To keep that rising tide lifting all boats. So these are the kinds of bedrock um, foundational laws that have been made over time, uh, brought to you by the labor movement. Um, so when I'm thinking about this generation, I know we've got obviously a lot of students and young people in the room. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and think about what this generation brings to the table. And since we in the labor movement are looking at how we modernize, how do we change and meet the needs of today's workforce, you have to kind of unpack and understand what, I don't know if it's Gen Z, Gen, you know, we have so many different generations now in the workplace. Um, obviously, I'm Gen X, we've got Gen Y, Gen Z, we've got millennials. Um, but you think about all the challenges this generation have endured, um, you know, confronted with, the, not just the climate crisis, uh, but a series of challenges, being born in the wake of 9-11, gun violence in schools, recessions, the fight for racial justice, the Trump presidency, a global pandemic, work environments that have been so rapidly changing with technology, um, attacks on social rights in the states and in the courts, um, you know, our, our reproductive freedom, uh, a housing crisis that is just exploding. Um, we're seeing it everywhere. Student debt skyrocketing. And CEO pay and corporate greed skyrocketing, right? And now the economy is on the brink yet again. And so it's almost coming full circle when I think about when I was graduating from the university in 1992. And um, it just feels like so much is out of our control at times. Um, and that the systems that are in place make it really hard to um, be heard, no matter how loudly you speak out. And this generation, though, I, I have so much hope for because this generation, I would say, is more civically minded, more in tune um, with events happening around them, um, more collaborative and willing to come together to solve problems and be solutions driven um, than I've ever seen. And the, the other thing is when you see injustice, you call it out. Um, and I think about women uh, coming up now um, you know, versus when I was coming up through the workplace. And even just when you see harassment, I think young women today are more inclined to be bold and say, you know what, that's just not happening. You can't, that's just not acceptable, right? And, and not feel afraid. So many generations before you, can I just say, had the whole, ha ha ha, is that what you just said? You know, um, and we had to endure it to get to the place where we are today. And so that gives me such hope because calling out injustice where you see it is foundational. And it's exactly what we need to build the kind of future that we wanna make possible for everyone. Um, and so thinking about um, the great hope I have for this next generation and, and what young people uh, bring to the table, I wanna connect that to the activism we're seeing today because there is so much union organizing happening around us. It is mind-boggling. Um, and I don't know if people had seen the Gallup poll recently, 71% of the public supports unions. It's the highest in 60 years. Because people are seeing unions out there fighting for change, fighting for working people no matter what kind of job you have. And it's infectious. And you see, um, you know, People in all kinds of industries, uh, whether it's the tech sector, um, Apple workers, who would have thought they'd be forming unions, right? Amazon, Starbucks, of course, grabbing the headlines, amazing organizing going on. Um, but also in places that you, you wouldn't expect, like I said last night, the cannabis industry, which, of course, we're very familiar with in Oregon. Um, but the notion of a wall-to-wall, -wall, seed-to-sale kind of model where Workers who are the bud tenders are, you know, able to um, take the knowledge that, that they possess 
and grow it into their skill set um, and find pathways to better jobs throughout the industry is exactly the kind of model that we want to see in every industry. Um, and in fact, I met with a, some cannabis workers not long ago, um, a young woman, we were doing a press conference, and you know, I, I'll stop talking after this. We were doing a press conference to talk about uh, the cannabis industry in New Jersey, and we had some workers on the, on the da dais with us, and the governor of New Jersey, myself, and the New, Jer New Jersey um, AFL-CIO. And we gave some remarks, and the press was ready to ask questions, and um, the governor spoke, it was great. Um, and then we said, okay, are we, are we ready to open it up for questions? And the young woman worker on the dais raised her hand. And she's like, I have a question. And we were kind of like, well, I think the questions are for the press, but <laughs> sure, you know? So she comes up to the podium and, and she goes, I want to know why my employer can force me to sign an NDA. Because I have knowledge and skills that are powerful and I want to be able to use that to make myself marketable. And I don't think that's fair. <laughs> and so we were all listening and nodding our heads and saying, yeah, that is, that is the case, isn't it, right? That everyone should be able to have that mastery and that, that knowledge and skill level and continue to have that take them through their journey in their careers. And so that was a, a subject of bargaining with their collective bargaining agreement that they decided was important for that particular group of workers. And so that's the beauty of collective bargaining. People are using it to negotiate all kinds of things. Um, digital journalists, right? They said, hey, our work is precarious and I might find myself out of a job tomorrow. And so, um, you know, having severance pay is critical for me to be able to move from job to job. So that's the number one topic that they negotiated in their collective bargaining agreement. I've seen young people who um, are negotiating the carbon footprint of their company into their contracts to say, you know what, we, we see things in this, we're frontline workers, we see what could be made more efficient and more effective. So we wanna bring that voice to the table and actually make this company run in a more responsible way. Um, so I find it incredibly exciting, um, very heartening to be in this mo movement in this moment because uh, I think we have just unlimited potential and we have the opportunity in the labor movement to actually um, meet the needs of workers of the future and how work is changing and evolving and uh, with technology especially, it's going to be so critically important across all kinds of work to have that voice, to have those protections uh, in a contract. And, um, you know, thinking coming out of the pandemic, how technology has hastened and workers are now being surveilled at their desks. I call it the new time clock where people are so desperate to work at home that they're trading off all kinds of rights without even really knowing it. Um, and being monitored, you're probably familiar, those of you who work at home, with the camera, every 10 seconds, screenshots being taken, mouse clicks being monitored, keyboard clicks. Um, now there's a thing on the internet called a mouse jiggler because people are trying to do workarounds, right? So this is the new era of work. And if we all want to make our country prosperous and the companies that move and, and produce in the country successful, you're gonna need a highly skilled, highly trained and productive workforce um, that feels that their contributions matter. Um, and so we think the labor movement is the place to do that. So with that, I guess we'll open it up to a conversation. Sure. Yeah, my name's Jim Pensero, I'm a member of the Journalism Advancement Council uh, two things. One, uh, starting, congratulations on going in the HOA and also the, getting the job you have. So Thank you. Uh, it's a very big deal. Um, this is, I have a lot of questions, but the first one is, is um, re Amazon. You win in Staten Island, you lose in upstate New York. Is there any learnings from the loss in upstate New York? That's part one. Part two is Starbucks. You win on some baristas, but Howard Schultz is all in. 
So I'd like to hear your thoughts on those two outcomes. Yes, fascinating to unpack. Um, and I will say the labor movement comes in many forms. So we have you know, a whole set of unions in the AFL-CIO. We also have independent unions that are forming and you know, doing their work outside the umbrella. But we're all one big movement. And um, I think innovation and experimentation in how you represent workers is really exciting. Um, and that would be the Amazon Labor Union, which is the one that won in, um, uh, in New York. Uh, we also have a union in Alabama, Bessemer, Alabama, with the RWDSU, the Retail Wholesale Department Store Union. Um, workers in, in Alabama wanted to form a union at Amazon, and RWDSU uh, represented a lot of workers in that area in the South, and so the Amazon workers decided to form their union with a more established union. So there's two different case studies of union representation, but also geography. Because if you think about what they were operating in, in Alabama, which is a right to work state, there are very few unions in Alabama. The public is very anti-union in Alabama. Um, and in New York, you have a whole um, you know, rich tradition of unions and high, what we call union density in, in New York, which is you just have a ton of union members up there. Um, in so many different interest industries. So, you know, in New York, they had all the community support. Um, people were excited because they were used to a union environment in their state. Um, Alabama, not so much. So, Alabama lost narrowly. They're, uh, actually, they re-ran the election, and they're going to probably end up a third election down there. Um, New York, you saw the Staten Island, um, Right, there was a second Staten Island that lost, too. So there was one success with 8,000 warehouse workers, and then you had two smaller, I think around 800 um, workers in those um, other uh, operations. Um, but I think what it is is the um, labor laws are broken. And it takes an absolute act of heroism to form a union because of the um, employer in intimidation that goes on. And in some cases, like in Alabama, those jobs were actually pretty decent paying jobs, right? People were like, I'm grateful for this job. I don't want to go messing around with this union thing because that could actually put me at risk. Um, and so there's a lot of misinformation that gets handed around. There's a lot of threats that take place. Um, and in the case of Amazon, that was at it, it, their poster children for um, the type of anti-union approach that gets taken. Um, there are consultants that get hired. Um, Amazon hired three of them. Um, millions and millions of dollars spent to basically surveil workers. Um, the elections happened by mail, so they had a mailbox that had, you know, looked really official, and a, and a camera installed over the mailbox. And even though people know, you know, you know that nothing's going to happen if you put your ballot in there and you're being watched on a camera. But it's a very intimidating thing. People think there might be some way they know how I voted. Um, they had the stoplight changed, the timing of it outside the facility, so that there wasn't time to stop and talk to union organizers. <laughs> and so, I mean, they stopped at nothing. And um, not a lot of people realize the amount of harassment that goes into a campaign. And so that's what we've seen every step of the way. And it works in some places better than others. And so it just worked better in Albany. You know, the, the company had the edge. Um, and so I think, you know, workers um, are showing incredible courage regardless. They know what the odds are, um, but they're persevering. And so that's why this 71% number, I think, is so high, is people are waking up to this notion like, oh, what's that thing called a union? Oh, well, that, I, I never thought that that would be for me. And in fact, it is. What about Starbucks? Because Starbucks is all in. All in opposing, yes. Um, which is really makes my heart sad because, um, you know, he he has a um, a good game. He talks a good game at least about being that corporate, socially responsible CEO and having brought you know healthcare benefits and education benefits and. Um, in, I, I've talked to a lot of the baristas there that say the premiums and the copays are so high that a lot of people don't get to even access the healthcare benefits. And then also the, um, 
education benefit, you have to have meet a th current threshold of hours that you work in order to participate. And of course, many people are kept right under that threshold so that they don't qualify. Um, so it's unfortunate because um, I think it became personal for Schultz that he saw this as a failure on his part if there was a union at Starbucks and because he, he thinks of himself as a benevolent leader and that, you know, how could people want to form a union when I'm so awesome, you know? Um, well, if you listen to your workers, and he has done some listening sessions, um, I just think he doesn't see the union as a partner that we can actually be um, helpful in making your company more successful. Um, and there's just a real lack of information and knowledge about what a union is. Um, it's really seen as a threat instead of an opportunity. So, yeah. So that's one of my questions. Yeah. How do you get over that hump of that? Because in theory, Howard should be a good partner because yeah. he does pride himself on being kind of a man exactly. of the people and wants to help. But that's if he right. instantly is like, so I would assume that's your job to change that perception. Yes, it is. Um, we are working on that. I think the best way we change perception is through our actions and like what we're seeing happening throughout the country. But we also do have a responsibility to um, you know, unpack what this means for people in very tangible ways. And um, I, I guess how to get to a Howard Schultz, you know, to even have that opportunity to sit down and say, what you think about unions may not be what it is. Um, and he, of course, has a whole bevy of lawyers around him feeding him like this would be a, ca a catastrophe, you know, why would you go there and, you know, it's going to drive your business model into the ground. And um, the interesting thing is I come from a tradition of labor management partnerships. And um, the electrical workers has a long history of working with their employers in the industry because the construction firms, for example, they need a, a consistent talent pipeline. And the union was the place where all of that apprenticeship training and knowledge was a pool of talent that could the industry could rely on for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? And they saw it as a key to their success to work with the unions. Um, and so it it's always boggles my mind when you see just the worst of corporate behavior come out. Um, and you just want to say, why? Because I think, um, and I will also acknowledge that there are some unions that are v very, um, you know, confrontation for confrontation's sake sometimes, right? Just to want to be disruptive or um, kind of always shake things up in a way that can be unhelpful. But often that's the result of being treated with disrespect and not being listened to and um, not being seen as partners. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in terms of, you know, culture um, and how people um, see and react to, to unions, and that is an education process. Um, so if you have thoughts and ideas, let me know. But I think we are doing um, what we call, um, you know, kind of our common sense economics training that we're trying to actually get out, not only within our uh, internal union movement, but also in places like universities. Um, I went and did a business school tour where I met with students in the business school because I think we need to be in those spaces, right? That um, to kind of um, take the mystery out of it. And, um, you know, the other thing that I recognized here is, uh, you know, in the J School, for example, all of the people you honored last night are all union members. And we were talking, Nancy and I were talking, like, there was no memo written about the fact that you would be joining a union when you left the SOJC, right? Because most of our fields in the business um, have union representation. So it's kind of an interesting thing because a lot of times people show up in their job and they're handed a union card and you're like, what is this? And what do I get for it, right? What is this dues money coming out of my pocket? And um, often people think of unions as an insurance policy that if I get in trouble or if I, you know, get fired, then I call the union. But that's absolutely not the case because the union is there, um, you know, to enrich every aspect of your life. And that's one thing we're looking at as far as the future of unions is how can we be more relevant to the workforce of the future? I'm thinking of more independent contractors, more you know, people who are on their own out there. They should be able to access the benefits of a union at scale. I think of you know, someone who can't buy a house because they can't get a mortgage because they don't have a, you know, a steady 
um, stream of income because they're working in a gig environment or you know, as an independent contractor, they should be able to access the scale of the labor movement to be able to have access to those resources, to be able to get advice on how to negotiate a contract for themselves. Um, and so this is about us kind of opening up our doors even wider um, to show that we're all in this together no matter what kind of work you do. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. Very nice to have you here. Um, I have a, a, a question, a thoughts around issue we were just mentioning a minute ago about the relationships between unions and employers mm -hmm. and how we frame those relationships mm -hmm. and how we try to build those relationships and what those relationships look like in, in, in terms of the extent to which they are collaborative and they are partnership-based. Um, of course, there are many millions of workers who uh, believe we need a much stronger approach yeah. <laughs> um, and are convinced that that kind of a, a collaborative model, one where Howard Schultz feels that the union is a partner, is doing the work that it needs to, that we need to do in order to actually empower workers and shift the balance of power in the country away right. from the corporate forces. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that in, in terms of in, in your position where you have a lot of interests you're having to sort of balance, um, but also you know, what you think about how do we approach that, that divide, especially as we look at a new generation of, of workers that have a much more pessimistic view of their future and Absolutely. a much more radical and yep. militant view of what needs to be done in order to shift no courses. Question. Yeah, no question. And it's interesting too because depending on the industry you come from, you have you know, a perspective and an experience that um, you bring to the table. And um, you know, of course, um, walking so many picket lines this year with workers on strike um, people really are waking up to their power. And so I think when we think about militancy and strikes and you know, more bold um, approaches for unions, um, that's what gives us the ability to have a longer term labor management partnership and be taken seriously, right? You have to have that strength within your bargaining unit. You have to have um, everyone all in to be able to have any power to leverage to get to a table where you're building kind of a longer term trust relationship. So it is a balance because you have to have both, right? If you're just constantly at each other's throats um, and no trust is built and, and um, you know, you're not seeing yourselves as producing a better outcome for everybody, then it's gonna fail, right? Um, and I think the, um, we have so many examples of ebbs and flows of militancy and partnership, and I'll take Kaiser Permanente as one example. I don't know if you're familiar with the long-term partnership there. Um, Kaiser Permanente, for most of you in the room, probably uh, know they're a you know, healthcare provider um, that has a long history, um, actually comes out of the labor movement. Our pension funds and uh, union resources actually were used to, to put the business model together to form, um, form Kaiser. And so it would only make sense that we would have a union relationship there. But over time, uh, it got more and more acrimonious because the company was just basically pursuing the ultimate co corporate greed. Um, they were looking chasing profits over people, as they say. And so over time, um, the bargaining became more um, hostile um, the union was like, you know what, we're not taking this anymore. We have to stand up for ourselves, we have to negotiate better. Uh, so ultimately it came to a point where they had their first strike and the strike was so bitter and it, it just broke Kaiser. It was so damaging for the entire, um, you know, the, health, the healthcare system itself and they came back to the table together and said, after this bitter strike, you know what we're really focused on here is patient outcomes. We should all be thinking about the service we provide to our patients. And so what are we gonna do to put this back together? And having that show of force, that strength, that strike, getting people, you know, the workers all in together, showing solidarity is what gave them the leverage to get the company back to the table to say, okay, we want something different. And I think that's emblematic of the moment we're in in the country right now, right? That people are so fed up and fired up 
and they're so angry and frustrated that they're acting out. And I, I would argue January 6th was the result of economic frustration that happened in places of the country that have been left behind. Jobs moving overseas, right, and, and lost opportunities. And so if we want to have stability in our democracy and our economy, we have to make sure that workers have an outlet and that we can see unions almost as a pillar of that kind of stability for our country. Um, and so today, Kaiser has a labor management partnership that has matured over decades. Um, they just actually were on the precipice of another strike just last year because here we go again, you know, it was like build the labor management partnership, everything's working well, we have peace in the valley, and then, oh, look at the corporation starts slipping again, starts treating people like crap, and then here we go to the bargaining table and workers are like, no, we're not gonna stand for that. And so it is this pendulum or the seesaw that, um, that there, there's a constant tension around. Um, but ultimately, I think it's exhausting to be in a constant state of um, you know, anger, frustration, and, and con um, confrontation, right? That people ultimately want to be able to provide for their patients. Um, and in fact, we were just at o OHSU yesterday, and it's the same situation there where the nurses are just saying, it is impossible to provide the care that we wanna provide to our patients because we are so short-staffed. The company has continued to cut back and so through their union contract, that's how they get back to the table and say, this is unsustainable. Do you wanna continue to go down this low road or do you wanna you know, invest more and make sure that we are the premier institution that you say we are to everybody in the public, right? So, yeah. I don't understand the economics of how this works. Um, how much does an employee have to pay it varies depending on the type of work. So in my union, for example, we represented, where I came from, the electrical workers, we represented electricians, I'll just use it as an example, um, who make very good wages, um, but have put in, you know, in a four to five year apprenticeship program, almost like a college degree. Um, so they pay around $50 a month. Okay, does it go by percentage of yeah. Some do, yes. Some do, uh, depending on if it's a higher wage environment. Some will use a percentage. Others will do a flat fee. I know with, for example, grocery workers who make a lower salary, they do a flat fee. So how do you know that your increase in wages, for example, are going to cover your union dues? Oh, it's been widely documented. Uh, a lot of uh, studies have been done on this that the um, kind of the union premium, you might call it, of not only in wages, but obviously healthcare benefits, retirement security, um, you know, some get education benefits, um, that that total package of benefits far outweighs the cost of any dues. Um, I'm looking around too, if anybody has any other examples, but um, I know my friend Bob is with the teachers in the back, I'm sorry? Yeah, with SAG-AFTRA, yeah. And yeah. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I first want to say it's awesome to have you here. Um, it gives me a lot of hope to have things like this happening on campus as a student worker organizer. Uh, it's hard sometimes. It often feels like our world is becoming increasingly alienated and in unequal and ruled by the interests of corporations. Um, and so it's great to have you here. Uh, my question is on kind of the, the future of the labor movement um, and what uh, strategy and, and structure uh, should be, you know, in your opinion, that future. And thinking about labor law and it's like in complete weakness right now, like hundreds of labor violations, relatively no repercussions for Starbucks or Amazon. Um, and I think that given that, I would assume that new unions would be forming um, and trying to be part of existing structures, but I think that there's been this big wave of independent unions, and it, it's kind of indicative of maybe some flaws in the way we are organized and our strategy as the labor movement. Um, and thinking about like historically over time as you know, trade unions to industrial unions, 
um, and kind of uh, the, the strategy that's changing. Um, what do you think the future is uh, as we trying to, to combat and the like decline of labor unions over the past 50 years? It's a lot to unpack. Um, I think that was like four questions, but yeah, you know, sorry. you'll keep me honest. Um, so I would say that the labor movement is in a moment of, it's sort of an inflection point where we've relied on a model for a very long time of how this is done. You know, you form a union together, workers come together, show their cards and get recognized or go to an election and then they either join up with an existing union or form their own union um, and then hopefully negotiate a contract. That's been the formula. Boom, 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 boom. Um, as labor law has gotten weaker, um, we don't have voluntary recognition, rarely anymore. Um, companies fight us tooth and nail uh, with little consequence, as you said, slap on the wrist, cost of doing business. Oh, I'm just going to you know, pay the fine and intimidate everybody and that way it keeps the union out. Um, so we need labor law reform and we're going to continue to fight for it. But we can't wait for labor law reform and workers aren't waiting right now. But they are the ones who are going to redefine what this movement looks like. And I think, um, at least for me and the way I see leadership, is that it is reflective of the democracy, right? We have, um, I'm in an elected role, by the way. You know, I'm not appointed, I'm not just handpicked. I have to be elected by um, our, our movement. And that happens at every single level in your workplace, in your union, um, you know, throughout. Um, and so I think with that in mind, we have to reflect in our leadership what our membership looks like, what they want, how they'd like to see the structure, and that's the beauty of it, is you get to define it. And um, I used the example earlier of digital journalists because it was kind of fresh on my mind that um, you know, they are very much social justice oriented. And they're covering all of the big questions, right, and the, that are going on in our society. And so it was important to them to define their union in such a way that reflects those priorities. And so they have a flatter structure in how they elect their leadership. Um, they get to define what they collectively bargain over. And so it is, um, you know, I, I say unions are a pillar of democracy. It truly is that we are for the big D and the little D. Um, because that's the way we operate. Um, as far as the, uh, I, I, it kind of drives me crazy actually this narrative that the quote independent unions are somehow different than the quote traditional labor movement. I think that's a divided and conquer tactic that they're somehow um, trying to put a wedge in between Amazon labor union and the rest of the labor movement. Um, and I, we've talked about this too with ALU. It's like this narrative is not helpful because you know, we're all in this together. And in fact, um, the AFL-CIO and our member unions have been funding independence. We've been lending office space to independence. We've been lending organizers. We've been doing trainings. We've been fighting their NLRB charges with our lawyers, you know. So there's this whole um, of labor approach to it. It's just it may take on different forms. And I think that's great. I think it's called innovation, right? That we're looking at new models and what's gonna best reflect what the workers wanna see in their movement. So, I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, you already asked a question, I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure there aren't any others before I go back to you. Okay, in the back. Yeah. The Walmart yeah. story, oh. in Oregon, now they voted down not to go to the yeah. Is that an indication that employee owned and operated businesses do not need it? Graham? <laughs> Graham Trainers, our Oregon AFL-CIO leader, by the way. I'm not familiar with that, yeah, but yeah. Does anyone else know? Yeah, there's another question. It was the question about employer, uh, employee-owned operations. Bymart. Bymart. Uh, okay, I won't get into that so long. <laughs> so okay. Happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm sorry I came late, came from the warehouser thing, which Ooh. I think we have some folks who were there, the woodworkers who are on, who've been on strike for some time. Um, six weeks. Six weeks. Uh, but I just wanted to get, say a couple things and then get to a question. Um, I think the first part, just about this issue of um, the 
you know, to be blunt, you know, there's, been, there's an antagonism between capital and labor. And, and we, it's important to really identify the, the history of this because w we didn't get an eight hour workday without you know, militancy, mm -hmm. right? right. Uh, and it was a militancy that was necessary to respond to the violence of, cap of, of the interests of capital. There's no way around that. That's the ruling class imposed this violence on working people. And there's so many memorials around the country commemorating these massacres that happened of working people where the National Guard or gun thugs or whoever else. I just want to highlight that because I, I think sometimes the onus is put on workers to have to you know, uh, be conciliatory when the, the history has really been one of a lot of suppression, of violence, and of, of anything but a partnership. The second part is about labor management partnership. I just want to be very careful about that because there's been research on that, I think even by Mike Parker, who really cautioned about the way labor management partnership can be used for the interests of management and can basically stifle union militancy, can um, basically say, oh, well, you have these other management-driven spaces for workers to give feedback, and so why do you need a union? So I would really highlight that. And I think finally the question just being that, you know, we're at a time with such severe inequality with incredible corporate profits, especially exacerbated in the context of the pandemic, that we're at a breaking point and I think that it's sort of, I want to get your thoughts about the labor movement taking on this question that what we see as outcomes are baked into the economic system. An economic system we should name is capitalism yeah. and that we have to think about something different. And, and how do you see the labor movement in the coming years taking on this issue of, of changing the way the economic system is structured that we have something more democratic or a more democratically oriented economic decision making in our country? Yeah, and, and thank you, yeah. <laughs> you articulated it perfectly, and, and in fact, my answer to your question was essentially, we were saying the same things, right? Is this, nothing comes without a demand, um, especially in the brutal system of capitalism, and it has tilted so far in favor of corporations and the lack of guardrails for working people is what we're talking about here. The economy is broken, it's not working for working people. And we're seeing that now every day with people on the picket line demanding more. And I just also came from the Weyerhaeuser, um, which was an, an announcement of a tentative agreement. We don't know what's gonna happen yet, but they're still striking, yes. Um, because of the fact that they're making record profits, historic profits at that company, yet are, approaching the bargaining table with a takeaway posture, um, trying to you know, reduce um, uh, vacation time, trying to make workers pay more for their health care, uh, fighting modest raises, um, obviously retirement security. Most people don't have retirement security at all anymore, and it becomes a more and more difficult thing to negotiate at the bargaining table because the rest of the economy is facing this falling floor that then makes it almost impossible to preserve the retirement security that we do have. Um, so you're absolutely right in terms of the, um, the brutality and the fact that um, the scales are just absolutely out of whack. Um, and so it is up to us um, to think about, are there new models? Are there, is this model so broken it can't be fixed? Where we can reclaim our power as workers and grow the percentage of people in unions to actually get companies to the table and bargain our fair share. So I would say the prescription is more union density. And that's what we're aspiring to now in this moment. And the onus is on us in the labor movement to take advantage of it and say, what are we gonna do? We have 71% of the public on our side. We have uh, the most pro-union administration in history in the White House who says the word union every day. We have working people taking risks, standing up despite the odds. And so what are we gonna do with it is the question. And so that's why we've made some announcements and starting a new, bold, I would say modern chapter of the labor movement and organizing has to be our number one priority. We have to look through the lens of organizing in everything we do. And there's this whole debate around like where are resources being 
put, right? Is the labor movement putting all of its focus in organizing or are they putting it into politics? And I would say it's not an either or, but what we need to do is take an organizing approach to our politics, right? And so that's what we're doing is investing in the ground game because we know that mobilizing, educating, and empowering workers in their communities is what is gonna make the change. And so that's what we've done um, through this political cycle and, and to make it enduring and long lasting and make it infrastructure that isn't just kind of ramping up and ramping down every election cycle. Um, but until we take the power back, this, this, this broken system is not gonna change. And so that's why it's so critically important in this moment that we think about unions as a tool to right the ship. That can be the solution to inequality. And that can give people the voice and respect that they deserve.